Hello and welcome to the Howard Stern Show. Uh, I got a great guest with me here today. I got uh, Gabriel Warren. Gabriel, you're you're still making music that's really rocking, you know. Howard, why are you Irish? <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to season two of the Limey and the Yank. We did four of these, I think, uh, two years ago. And then I don't know what happened. Was it two but... years ago? Holy cow! <laughs> but now we are back, and we are on Stand in Stands channel, which yes. means there are people who don't know who the fuck I am. Why don't you tell them who you are, Andrew? Okay, so you're welcome. I'm the entire reason you have Stand in Stand back. There you go. <laughs> no, uh, so I contacted Stan in Stan a couple of years ago asking to do an interview with him. The interview never materialized, but a magical friendship did. Indeed. Uh, you came back to YouTube. I edited a few of your videos, and then your brother, Confuse Matthew, came back a couple weeks or a couple months later. And I'm going to claim credit for that, even though it's probably not me. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, I dug up some old fossils and I made Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. That's actually, I like that analogy. Yeah, it's very accurate. Yeah, um, Confused Matthew came back very, um, unfortunately, briefly. I would have preferred that he stay around, but he had personal reasons for not sticking around. And I did, thanks to you and your editing uh, talents, make a few videos a couple of years ago. And I was doing things, and then life happened, and then life happened again, and then more stuff happened. and. Now I'm trying to slowly crawl back to a place, now that I have a schedule that's conducive to that of a human being, um, slowly get back to a place where I can just talk about things again, which is one of my favorite things in the world to do. So yeah, good, good stuff. So we did a very short first season of this where we tried to just figure out what exactly we were doing, and we did that. Uh, for four episodes just talking bullshit. It actually started with Ready Player One, which is obviously that book that uh, mm. you really like and I really don't like. But the bottom line is um, you can find all of season one. It's not particularly good, but <laughs> it's kind of funny. And uh, yeah, we are we're going. So with that, um, so YMS roasted the shit out of your brother, didn't he? Which is the springboard for today. <laughs> yeah, he did a reaction. Well, some specifically, somebody recorded him. They, well, they didn't record it. They edited him reacting to my brother's old Lion King review, which a lot of people have had very strong reactions to over the years. And um, I, he found out about it because he has a really small... Um, following on Twitch as just himself. He doesn't do Confused Matthew anymore. But he found out about it, and people were asking him about it, and his answers to their questions were, I don't know, I haven't seen it, I don't do Confused Matthew anymore, blah, blah, blah. So being the kind of guy I am, I watched it in its entirety, and I was going to go on my YouTube channel for the first time in ever, and just kind of live stream a little reaction to a reaction thing because I thought it was really funny and I like your movie sucks and I thought it was I thought it was just a funny look at his old review and kind of the impact that it's left on some people and what ended up happening was my brother actually came on the stream and uh, confused Matthew and I kind of reacted to it together and um, your movie sucks saw that uh and i'm I, I i wish i could apologize to him for having to listen to it because the audio was terrible he didn't but, get to um, listen to the cleaned up version either <laughs> yeah they should listen to the cleaned up version yes anybody should which thank you for that by the way and so um so we watched so he he your movie sucks reacted to our reaction and it was equally good and equally funny and uh, just the whole thing was really cool and, the, and super just super positive and I all that. I haven't seen his, uh, his reaction to the reaction. Like, what was he? What was kind of the gist of it? 
Well, it was uh, it was just a thing he was doing on on Twitch. Well, so he he he'll he goes live on Twitch while he edits his stuff yeah. for his like patrons or whatever. And he was just listening to it on his phone. And um, uh, I, I I can't really remember anything specific off the top of my head that he did. I think the vod is still up there, but um, it was. Uh, no, he, 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 we reacted to his thing positively. He reacted to our thing positively. Um, he reached out to us on the on my YouTube channel. But you know what sucks is that um, that video now has well over a thousand views because he posted it on his subreddit. So it's the most <laughs> attention. It's the most attention that anything I've done has ever gotten. And it's the worst thing that I've ever recorded yep. in terms of audio. So unfortunately, that happens sometimes. But yeah, that that's basically it. It was pretty cool. See, I I watched it and I am now very very familiar with his arguments against Confused Matthew's first review, which is an important distinction to make. I think like the first review, mm -hmm. and um, to be honest, I thought a lot of it was quite fair. I I um, I've got this really um, interesting relationship with. Um, Confuse Matthew's videos because much like YMS I was majorly inspired by Confuse Matthew because because he comes across as such a contrarian um, mm -hmm. he his videos really made me think about how I look at film and mm -hmm. cause I was I'm I'm a, a fair bit younger than you so um, for me it was actually some quite early like oh i see kind of thing of like the idea mm -hmm. that someone is going man the lion king is utter shite sort of thing the idea that you could have that spicy take on it and sort of think about it for me as like a teenager it was a, a big thing to be like huh and um i look back at confused matthew's videos and with all respect to him i really don't think they hold up for me at least in the as I have, as I have like learned more about film, have made my own short films and like started really doing my own like analysis into film, I I now have a lot of problem with um, Confused Matthew's like approach to criticizing film, and mm -hmm. um, what I think is interesting is I also have a, a bit of a problem with how YMS, uh, how Adam mm -hmm. criticizes film as well um well let me let me ask yeah. you a quick question about so with my brother what is your what is your um what is your issue with his approach i'm really curious about that because that that kind of ties into something i uh, it's a burning question i have um if i ever get a chance to chat with adam i want to ask him this question but i'll ask you first but okay. before i do what what is your what is your issue with his approach so my issue with his approach is that he reviews films as though he is reviewing a book um okay confuse matthew by his own and i am talking about confuse matthew i've never actually spoken to your brother for more than a few like brief facebook messages on something you've posted, yeah, yeah. so i don't so i do mean just confuse matthew that persona he reviews everything from a script standard how what is the screenplay like and I have a big problem with this because um, a script and like a movie story is written it's first written as a script then it is rewritten many times then it is rewritten again literally on set by actors and directors coming up with different ideas on the spot that change drastically potentially the story then it is rewritten again in the final edit um, there's a great video on how Star Wars is completely saved by the editor and how there's loads of scenes that you can see and you're like, wow, that's really bad. I've, I've seen that. I've yeah. seen that. Yeah, that is really good. Now, mm -hmm. my problem is that Confused Matthew is so laser focused on script as storytelling when he does review a 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is a film I don't particularly like either, or when he mm. reviews A No Country for Old Men. Um, his argumentation tends to fall out of the window because those films use the visual language of storytelling 
um, to convey most of their points. And I have never from a single Confused Matthew video ever got the impression that he understands the visual language of film. And I think if you're a film critic, and I know he's not a professional film critic, but I think if you're criticising um, film as an art form, I think that is a key piece of knowledge that you need and I don't feel he's ever had it. So that is that is my my take. P.S. Confused so that, Matthew, I love you. That's extremely interesting. So one of the things that I thought a lot about ever since the Your Movie Sucks thing is exactly what you just described. Um, I would say that just going by, as you say, the script, which is really just kind of what's being said and done on the screen, as opposed to the techniques that filmmakers use or, or something like that, I would say that that is how most people evaluate what they're seeing. Um, I would guess that that's the case. And what I mean by that is Adam was Adam was going over Dan's Lion King review and our reaction to his reaction, okay? And when it got to the part where he had suggested that Dan would have hated a certain movie, I can't remember what it is. Do you remember uh, what it is? It was Phantom Thread. Um, Phantom Thread, yeah, that's the one. Phantom Thread. When you were doing an English, an English accent, I got you to quote his breakfast order. Yeah, fancy oh, friends. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So when he said that um, he thought that Dan would have... When I say Dan, by the way, Dan is confused Matthew for those people who don't... Oh, can I just interject and say that I completely disagree because Confused Matthew gave a glowing review of There Will Be Blood, which is directed by the same director as Phantom Thread and starring the same lead actor. Oh, is that right? I love There, there Will Be Blood was fantastic it was that, that, that was sensational um so may, so yeah maybe that that might be but um i had said in our in our reaction to the reaction that dan and i had never heard of the, or that i had never heard of that movie and then dan chimed in and said he'd never heard of it mm -hmm. and at that point when adam was listening to this he said ah he said something to the effect of aha this is might be one of the reasons why um why we gave Lion King this kind of reaction is that we're not the kind of people who would be familiar with the works of Paul Thomas Anderson or something to that effect. And he, th this, that's the thing that I've been thinking about for the last few days because he is correct. Um, Adam from Your Movie Sucks, as well as yourself, you guys watch movies in part because you love movies you guys both appear to love the art of filmmaking as a subject mm -hmm. and dan and i are very different we we saw the movies that were popular when we were little kids that our parents took us to and then when we were teenagers going to movies with our friends or on dates or or what have you and that was the kind of the motivating factor of us seeing movies. It wasn't a love for the art of filmmaking. I dare, I think I'm pretty safe in saying that Dan and I don't give a flying fuck about the art of filmmaking as a subject. So that's a, I find it, I, I find that really interesting that people like you and Adam would bring to it your knowledge of filmmaking. And I don't think that the average person does because I don't think the average person really knows that uh, i think the average person knows about as much as dan and i know about the actual techniques that are involved in filmmaking we're aware of them when we're watching them on the screen because the director can can um train your eye to a certain the place or directs you to your attention it. sure exactly and causes you to feel sir but i think that most people aren't aware of that and that wouldn't be part of their analysis in whether or not a movie is good and they the audience shouldn't be aware of it um, because when you're casually watching a film, uh, you should just be engrossed in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I agree, but where I, uh, where I have criticism with Confused Matthew is, though I appreciate he did, did it as a hobby, he's not, he's not like a professional film critic, or he didn't study film, or he doesn't make films, or something like that. While I appreciate that, uh, he does put his uh, opinion out there, or did rather, 
as as um, as a critic because it's a review. He says it's a review, which means he is in in those videos a critic. And sure, I and, and this that, is what I find so and this yeah. is what I find so fascinating about that dichotomy is that I think Dan is a critic in the sense that anybody at all who goes to see a movie is in their own experience criticizing it as opposed to something like a professional film critic hold on sorry as opposed to something like a professional film critic who would bring to it more of a what's the word i'm looking for um a little bit more sophistication than just the average moviegoer and that was the thing that i that was the thing that i the conclusion that i came to in my head is that dan and i are moviegoers as opposed to film buffs and that's an interesting dichotomy yeah. because I would, say, I would say i agree i think you're right yeah yeah and that's an interesting dichotomy because i think that the average person is just as qualified to evaluate their own experience with a film as somebody who is has a little bit more sophistication about the art of filmmaking but both are valuable i think it would so, just be kind of two different um two different angles yeah i agree but here is where and i swear to god um confuse matthew this is not a hit piece on you um but here is um here is where my second issue comes in because i would agree he's a movie goer however he had a video on his website called mm -hmm. on objectivity mm -hmm. where he uh, lined out his reasoning for why he thought these movies were objectively bad and um, and that is where I'm like because that has become a bit of a thing in a uh, film uh, YouTube not I'm gonna piss a load of people off here not real film critics YouTube mm -hmm. film critic mm -hmm. circles um, where there are certain people who I won't name who make these fucking hit pieces on these movies and explain why these movies are objectively bad like that these movies these movies are factually they are bad movies and I think that's iffy and Confused Matthew is not guilty of this by the way he made a video on why he thinks these films are objectively bad but he has never been toxic in how he criticizes a film he's always been very playful. i wish i wish i could remember what he said in that i don't remember i don't remember that video at all i don't fair. remember what his criteria was yeah and, and to be fair it was a long time ago but this is where i'm a little bit like huh, because i think that when you're making a claim even in passing of like this film is objectively bad uh you're mm -hmm. putting a bit of authority on that and I think that generally, if you're putting, putting a bit of like an authoritative stamp on that, maybe you should know the difference between a director and a production designer. Because <laughs> that's what I had to laugh at when he did his Ready Player One review. And uh -huh. he said that the direction was really bad because the movie looked like, I can't remember if he said the movie looked fake or something like that. But what I remember was he said, the direction of this movie is bad because this. And then he laid out a bunch of things that are the work and responsibility of the production designer of a film, not the director. Sure. Which, but, um, but the thing which, about yeah. that is, if he had said production designer, his point is unchanged. Like, I, I, that's interesting because I'm not sure that. Sure, that but makes... he didn't. Which is which is where I where I disagree. If he had said the production design of this film is bad because of this and this and this, I'd be like, okay, disagree, but fair enough. But he said the direction is bad, which obviously indicates like a lack of understanding of film. But like obviously, I want to move away from like specifically um, confuse Matthew because I I love the guy and I don't. No, want, no, like, no. Well, 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 believe me, we we yeah. we are not the kind of people that take yeah. things personally very easily. Let me just kind of expound on that a little bit. So he didn't understand. So 
he didn't understand that it was the production diner designer production diner he didn't understand that it was the production designer as opposed to the director who was making everything look like that but his point is kind of the same i'm not sure that that makes a difference because what he was trying to get across is that the movie looked a certain way he just didn't know who was responsible for doing that and the, so the 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 point is valid he just didn't know which yeah but department can you see how that's kind of a silly thing to have in a review like like Not, i think it, oh, I, uh-huh. I agree his point in essence is unchanged but i think it speaks to the quality of the information that you are getting and um obviously i'm probably going to come across like a right fucking snob um i'm largely playing devil's advocate here because um, sure. something that I equally don't like is I don't like people who just like nitpick films to death like uh-huh. there was a video that um, interestingly on YMS's podcast uh, Sardonicast um, YMS and his friends tore this video by Patrick Willems apart where uh, Patrick Willems made a, a video where he essentially said you're watching movies wrong which was clearly hyperbolic and it pissed them off because what he said he said if you are taking a film and you are nitpicking every little piece of it and trying to like come up with loads of little plot holes that don't matter to try and like overall say the film is bad you have probably missed the point of the film and i don't completely agree but um what i thought was interesting is that ymes reacted quite negatively to that video and i would argue that quite often that is the sort of criticizing that YMS himself falls into paying more attention to the um, the little nitpicky things rather than the overall experience that you're getting from the film mm. no, like I don't like when people just focus on like really really nitpicky things they're like well why didn't Luke Skywalker do this why mm-hmm. didn't Marty McFly just do this it would have saved all this time because it's a lot of the time it's like because you need to have a certain amount of bullshit in order for a film to work. <laughs> of course. You know, this is what, it, talking about Star Wars, even though I agreed with everybody that the, um, what was it, The Last Skywalker? What the hell was the last the, one called? The third the, one? The most recent fan fiction that got into cinemas, yeah? Uh, Rise of Skywalker. Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, even though I agree with everybody else that that movie was bad, for probably all the same reasons, I think people were overreacting even to how bad that was just by the nitpicky shit. I think the Star Wars films are actually a fascinating example because I would argue that in concept, the prequel films are easily, easily better than the sequel movies that Disney has made. But Jesus Christ, you wouldn't know it by watching the films, would you? It, like it really, de- it really depends. I would rather watch the sequel films any day. I, I, I don't like watching the prequels, I and agree. I don't. Yeah, but in terms of construction, it, would you rather see something that was really badly made? Or a story that was really badly told. That's because the prequels didn't really have a story. They they were just all over the place. It was just they had politics, ev- wasn't it? It was hard to follow. It was yeah, they, they had they were just events that they needed to have yes. shown on the screen and occasionally interrupted by lightsaber fights and a bunch of just completely terrible dialogue, terrible characterization, terrible plotting. As opposed to the sequels, who were uh, that actually had a lot of promise and just dropped the ball every time they could have made this something great. Every yeah, time they could have actually capitalized on something that they established, they just failed. So it it, it really depends. Would, would you rather have um, very yeah, very they, low expectations not be met, anywhere. or very very high expectations not be met? Huh. They, they, they could have gone anywhere like they didn't need to do rebels and empire again they could have made it about a civil war within the jedi mm-hmm. council like the new jedi order that i assume i think yeah i think in canon it did exist in the disney they could have made it about like they could have made it about like an inter-civil war with like jedis fighting jedi they could have made it anything but they went with the familiar they went with 
Well, well I can understand why they did that because je because Star Wars was made for general audiences and general audiences really wanted something that they could have mm. again. Um, but my thing is, even that they did wrong because they started out with um, a kind of a soft reboot of the Literally original. just the first one. Kind of yeah. Yeah. They, well, you will. Well, a, a situation where somebody has to figure out who they are and 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 their place in the galaxy or whatever, and yeah. learn to be a Jedi and all that. And then in the second movie, somebody very creative, finally, finally Steps did something in. unexpected in the in a Star Wars movie mm -hmm. and did something that people didn't expect and that wasn't conventional and that took your expectations and turned them on your head in a good way not in the way that like red letter media described i think they thought that they were doing that just to do it and it didn't seem that way to me it seemed like they were doing this for a purpose and then in the third movie they had the the original guy back so he just fast forwarded everything to try and get the outcomes that he wanted and that yeah that was what was weird because ryan johnson ends the trilogy with the second film yes like, well like... And, and starts something yeah starts something very new i mean you could almost watch yeah. that as a standalone and i fully appreciate i fully fully appreciate that it was polarizing and that some fans didn't like the direction, didn't want it to go that way. But what I also think is, is that I think a, a lot of people who are watching Star Wars are not old enough to remember when Empire Strikes Back came out, because that one was also really polarizing when it came out. Mm -hmm. That one was Indeed really was. polarizing. That one, Indeed it was, yes. It, it, drops the, it drops, no, I am your father on Luke Skywalker. Like, it was, um, it, it was polarizing, it was different, and it pissed people off. And I don't think people um, are old enough to remember the actual reaction. In the same way that I don't think that young kids who are seeing those films now, like, you know, like six or seven year olds that are going to see the Star Wars films, I think when they grow up, I think they'll just kind of see The Last Jedi as a film. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think Rise of Skywalker will always be weird. I don't think you'll. I don't think you can ever get past the fact that the Last Jedi does not contradict the Force Awakens. It gives you mm -hmm. new revelations about the Force Awakens. Rise of Skywalker does contradict the Last Jedi in theming. It doesn't contradict yeah. it in narrative, but it does contradict it in theming, and that's, I think, a really big problem. A really, I agree. really big problem. But saying on like what you were saying about a story, like, a, would you rather see a story well, like, well told, or like, interesting ideas not well told? Uh, this is why I actually um, divide the room, divide the audience. I like James Cameron's 2009 film Avatar. I like it. I have heard every complaint in the book about it just being Dances with Wolves, just being Fern Gully, and I literally do not think any of those complaints matter. It tells its story well. It's not the best uh, story, I... and it's not the best film, but your thoughts. Um, I saw it, what year did that come out? Um, 2009. Jesus Christ. Um, I saw it when it was new. I didn't see it in 3D because I knew that that was bullshit. Um, I think you I missed out. The... Really? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just very quickly say, it didn't use 3D to make shit jump out of the screen. It used 3D to make the trees and the world look either more forwards towards you or more backwards to make the jungle and that look deeper. Mm -hmm. It didn't have, like, constant arrows shooting out of the screen or, like, a ping-pong ball. Going yeah, I, yeah, totally. I, I heard that at the time, and I to, to be perfectly honest, I still didn't miss it. But it, uh, I mean, it, fair, that's fair. cool. That's cool. But I, you know, I saw it in the theater once. I have never seen it again in the now what eleven years since it's come out. Mm -hmm. I've never thought about it for an yep. instant after yep. I've seen it. It has evaporated from my mind. A lot of people say that. A lot of people say that. Really? Yeah, that is, there was um, there's a great video by Jenny Nicholson on the Pandora themed land within Walt Disney World. Oh shit! Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. 
And the yeah. whole thing was about how they did all of this kind of as a reaction, but in doing so, they kind of made a themed land based on something that wasn't really in the cultural zeitgeist. And by the way, yeah. I've been there. And it's fantastic. I, I um, it looked really cool. It looked it's... really cool. Well, I, I remember hearing. Um, I remember hearing at the time that there. And I don't. I never know how real these kinds of stories are. But I remember hearing at the time that there were people who were actually like getting depressed that Pandora. That was the planet, right? Yeah, I heard. I heard that was. Um... I, that I they were, that it wasn't a real place and people were like really upset about that so yeah hey, cool it's... now they have a place they can go to yeah and um and i actually think that those stories about those people being having like post pandora blues ironically because the people there are blue i think the stories of them <laughs> having that sort of depression i think that that speaks to a fact that i think for a lot of people uh those avatar films Oh, sorry, that Avatar film. There is going to be a sequel. Apparently, he's been saying it. He's been threatening us with a sequel for years. Apparently, uh, they yeah. just finished filming it. Um, wow. But um, I think it must have struck a chord with some people. I wouldn't say it struck a chord with me. I don't think about it tons. But when I do think about it, I was like, yeah, it was a good film. It was a story well told. I don't think about it very often. But I would never claim. But my, my response is that people really like to seem to say that it was a bad film. And I'm like, no. Now, no. a bad film would have stood out to me more. Um, yeah. I had this experience, my brother, I recently, I recently encouraged him and actually bought a rental for him to watch a movie called The Duelists, which was Ridley Scott's first film. First film, film. yeah. Yeah, and I, I saw it very recently. I had never heard of it, and it's kind of come back into popularity uh, now as kind of a cult classic all these decades mm. later. Um, and I, I saw it because... One of the most realistic sword fights caught on film. Sorry, what? It was one of the, most, real... one of the most realistic sword fights um, put to film. Yeah, and I, I, I saw it because I'm into what's called... Well, I'm not into it personally, but I, I'm into watching people who are into what's called HEMA, which is historical European martial arts where they learned to fight with like swords and shields the way that they used to back in the days. Yep. And those guys were all reviewing the the fights from it. And I we thought share it that really interest, cool. by the way. <laughs> What's that? We share that interest. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm glad we do. I think it's cool. I think it's really cool. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, they they reviewed the fights, and I thought it looked. I thought the fights looked really good, so I watched it. It turns out to be a really, really interesting film. And I encouraged my brother to watch it, and he watched about half of it, and he told me that he it was like watching nothing, and he turned it off and he never watched it again. So that, that kind of like my experience with Avatar, it evaporated from his mm -hmm. consciousness. Although I don't understand why, because I think it was a very substantive film you know they made that have you seen it by the way i haven't seen it i've been meaning to i just haven't <laughs> yeah keep in mind when you watch it that movie was made for under a million dollars they 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 th it was kind of like um in back to the future how the score makes the movie seem a lot bigger and more bigger budget than it actually is yeah. um except instead of the score it's like ridley scott's directing and the and the locations how they got some of these shots there's a shot at the very end where harvey keitel's looking at a sunset and the sun peaks behind the clouds and you can see the sun the um the lens flares on the camera while he's in this like a like shot where he's just looking out to the to the horizon or whatever they didn't have like cgi back then to do that that was live i have they of uh, the 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 second duel that the two of them fight the lighting they i i would i would hazard that they had minutes to get that shot done before Very the likely. sun went down it was just it, he 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 made such good use of what he had for such a tiny little budget. And yeah. the last thing I'll say about the budget issue, the reason that that movie is called The Duelist and that it has the story that it does is it was based on a short story that was written in the early 1900s or something. And the reason that he made it out of that story is that he, they didn't have any money. He wanted to make a film, and so they needed something that was public domain. So... Yep. Like, this is, this is a really important thing. So 
I re I am um, I revisited my high school, as you you guys would call it. Um, uh -huh. I revisited my high school to give a talk to the media students who are looking to go into uh, film courses and things like that. And what the talk I gave them was about was about how to make your own work and how to make your own resume so that you have something to show other than I went to school here you go and I said I gave them an example I said right now if I gave Steven Spielberg an iPhone and nothing else and I gave you guys 65 million dollars and two Hollywood actors Steven Spielberg will come back with a better film yeah because it's not about your budget and your resources it is about your creativity and mm -hmm. I said the reason I'm saying this to you now is because what I want you to do is make your own movies just film them on your phone film them on your phone edit them with whatever cheap software you can get your hands on and just practice shooting and cutting shooting and cutting and that is it to and do it in as many different ways film the most boring things in the most interesting ways you can because that is what makes a good uh, filmmaker and um, obviously someone will now go to my channel and they will look at the short films I've made and they will probably go take your own advice um, but oh, I, uh, don't so. I, I don't but, think um, so. I've seen your short films, and I think they're very good. But um, like basically, that was that was my, that was my advice: is that get really good at just using the bare minimum, because that's what like Ridley Scott goes and does. Mm -hmm. um, and and making yeah. making good use of what you have is first of all, it's good advice for life. Anything that you do in mm -hmm. life, making good use of what you have is a skill that will it'll make or break you as a person as you as you go through life but making good use of what you have in art is the you know if you look at the state of movies today and you look at the enormous budgets that these movies have and how really mediocre they tend to be i mean yeah. there's your answer right there i don't feel like i get 400 million dollars worth of film when I see a lot of big blockbuster films yeah no and if it, and you would get I think a lot more bang for your buck with something like a duelists or or, or something like that or <laughs> or Star Trek 2 had a tiny tiny budget where mm -hmm. Nick Meyer came in and just he used everything at his disposal he used stock footage from the first movie he used props from the first movie he literally went into like dumpsters and got out props from the first movie to use in this like he he did everything that he could to make the movie as good as it could I it in it and it seems like well well he himself said that art thrives on limitations and I, I think that's true. Yeah, and if you look at the state of movies today and you look at how few limitations there are now, I think there's a correlation there between the relative lack of... I mean, they look amazing, but the sort of, in terms of the movies themselves, the relative lack of quality um, as compared to movies with that used... It used to be okay to not have multi-million dollar budgets, and I, I think I think that has to be restored again today. So my local cinema is showing uh, lots of old movies at the moment because a lot of new movies are not yet being released into cinema. They're being withheld because the Black Death is upon us. Spanish flu rise mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Um, and um, this week I have seen, uh, well, a handful of old films, but I'm going to talk about the, the two that have... Uh, had the most impact on me for the record the third one was Carrie which I'd never seen before and it was good it was very creative and very well mm. made but I'm going to talk about um, The Exorcist and Jurassic Park specifically on your point about budget mm -hmm. um, The Exorcist feels real because when you go into that scene and the bed is shaking and Reagan is screaming on top of it she's terrified because the bed is shaking that bed is actually shaking 
when yeah. you see that in sort of thing in modern films, modern exorcist films, like um, the bed shaking is a either a visual effect or digital color grading is used to make the the scene moodier, creepier, scarier. And what it ends up doing is taking away a layer of authenticity and make you more aware that you're watching a film. And this is a big thing for me with Jurassic Park. Something you hear a lot on the internet, and I think it's really true, is that the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park look better than the dinosaurs in Jurassic World. Because yes, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, for the most part, are actually big animatronic puppets. Um, um, a lot of people are surprised at how little CG there actually is in Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. um, they're mostly puppets. Jurassic World used the puppets on set and then CGI'd over them to try and make them look more real. But yeah. In doing so, they no longer look real. When you are in uh, the offices, like you know the control room in Jurassic World where um, they're all, the, all the dozens of people are working on the computers. Yeah, yeah. That atmospheric lighting, everything's kind of a steel blue gray. It's like a, it's like a secret control room kind of vibe. And then you go back to Jurassic Park. The control room is an office. Yeah. It is a dark, shady office with Samuel L. Jackson smoke blowing everywhere. Yep. It feels real. When the kids have to hide in the vent up the t up the top from the Velociraptors, like Grant pulls Lex up into the vent, and the raptor jumps, and it just misses her, and they crawl through the vent. It's not like a movie vent where everything's again blue and grey and uh, like harsh light it just looks like they're in a vent like mm -hmm. an actual vent and I think that that is a big problem now I think that in trying to attain something deemed as cinematic I think so many blockbuster films nowadays just miss the grit and authenticity of being in the moment in the film the first Jurassic Park uh, and I know I'm rambling a bit, but the first Jurassic Park, every single time you see a dinosaur, you see the dinosaur from a human perspective, looking up, or when you're in the, or when they're in the car, you see them, you see from inside the car, or from at the car's level during the T-Rex attack. You never get these big aerial shots of the T-Rex like you do in the Jurassic World films. Mm -hmm. everything is from a human level so those dinosaurs always feel like they're real plus the fact that it's dark and raining hides when the CG is like the CG doesn't show its age very much because most of the time when the dinosaurs are CG they're in the dark and it's raining yeah um, but yeah that's uh, that's um, a big a big thing for me that you sort of jogged my mind on when you said like the size of the budgets but not necessarily getting 400 million worth of film yeah well and, and 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 another thing about the original jurassic park films is that um you're seeing the dinosaurs in the human perspective but the actors are seeing the dinosaurs too which is yeah. i think a, the the um it seems to me actors now if they're in a particular genre they have to practice pretending like something's on screen with them mm -hmm. and uh, almost like how um almost like how an actor has to practice doing a phone call when there's nobody actually on the phone mm -hmm. but the, but like in an actual scene where they're supposed to be interacting with something or somebody and i think that's a serious like like um it's just harder it's that speak speaking as an actor it's just harder like um and something. it's unnecessary. Like you could actually have something there that would probably be cheaper mm -hmm. than all of the bells and whistles that you're trying to put into it. I I wonder, I wonder how much. Uh, what do you call it? I I wonder how much um, screen resolutions and all that have to do with this too, where everything's trying to be like in 4K now and maybe, maybe you know. because. I don't think Guardians of the Galaxy 
ever has that problem with Rocket Raccoon. Because yeah, I agree. Yeah, because there is actually an actor there who plays Rocket Raccoon on set. It's uh, Sean Gunn, James Gunn's brother. Mm -hmm. He walks about on his knees with a little bit of costume, but mostly in a like a suit that can be easily digitally removed out. But I think even though it is CG and it's not. It's never as organic as an actual puppet. Um, I do think he always feels like he's there because those actors actually look at someone and get a reaction from someone back. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that's like I, I don't know. I don't know why there. I don't know why um, so many of these movies feel the need to skip over that. Um, it's and a lot of the time in these like big special effects movies now it used to be that a big special effects movie was something like a jurassic park where you were going to see something that did look authentic it, the, the cg was there to try and make it look more real now it just kind of seems to be there to have something fancy on the screen that looks like a cartoon i don't know yeah they, they're having to go backwards because now with digital effects we've seen practically everything that can be seen which means i am not kidding you they are actually planning on blasting tom cruise into space for a film and they're <laughs> actually planning on shooting this film in space elon Mu i'm not joking elon musk is involved and um tom cruise is starring and the director whose name has completely gone out of my head but he's fantastic mm. he's directed the last two mission impossible films and they're both brilliant but mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're actually planning, and whether they succeed or not, I don't know. They tr they yeah. want to shoot a Tom Cruise movie, actually with scenes in real life outer space. Oh, that's that's just good marketing right there. Yeah, I, I mean, I question, nothing. I question whether they will be able to send a nearly sixty year old man into space. Um, I do, I do tend to think that maybe this might not happen but the fact that they are they are wanting to do this i think yeah. says something about how maybe audiences are going to start wanting to see something more real again and obviously the dinosaurs in jurassic park were never real but they felt real so here's the thing i've been thinking about um general audiences and their expectations and it seems like today um movies are trying to kind of hedge their bets what with the cinematic universes and all that and one would get the impression today that movie studios because they make so many gajillions of dollars off these movies and every movie is like a blockbuster thing and it doesn't seem like there are very many little movies anymore everything is like a multi billion dollar blockbuster now it would seem like um studios have figured out like the ingredients to put in a movie to make everybody and their brother see it mm. and that's kind of where my head was at until i thought about the fact that when as i said before dan and i saw the movies that were popular so we weren't film bus we didn't go out of our way to see something we would see it if it was talked about or, or our friends wanted to see it or everybody was saying you have to see this and one of those movies was Pulp Fiction mm. and I remember when Pulp Fiction came out how explosive it was and I also remember that after Pulp Fiction came out there was a brief resurgence of I don't know if art film is the actual term but more artful movies like magnolia and th th things things that were kind of oddball and things that were kind of um unconventional yeah. movies and everybody wanted to make those kinds of movies because those were the ones that were selling and when i thought about that it occurred to me i have no idea what drives popular culture no idea it doesn't seem like general audiences have any expectations whatsoever because if they did they would something like a pulp fiction wouldn't have registered with them i it's just yeah, I such a curiosity to either. me yeah i really don't think studios know the answer either it's it's very strange like um i'll shout out uh studio chojin who has um 
who's a, who's an absolute mad lad, by the way. He's um, I've been friends with him for a little while, and he just literally the other day, well, okay, it's the other day, a couple months ago, he announced in his channel updates that he's gonna be reviewing hentai, and he said because I'm fed up with the discourse on anime being so highbrow, I want to drag it back down to the gutter. Um, <laughs> but he was saying that he thinks that we will probably experience another resurgence of more like small budget like not if not art house but like more dramatic sort of experimental films being popular again in the future like the last the last example of a film that was not a big fucking action film that it seemed like everyone saw was baby driver um and before that, like The Wolf of Wall Street, like there are films that did really well, like Shape of Water did really well, but I don't mm -hmm. think bajillions of people were seeing it, like bajillions of people were seeing Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. But like, what I what I think is interesting is like you go back to like old horror films, like I mentioned I saw Carrie uh, for the first time and I saw The Exorcist again. And it's like, these were, these were like big directors working on horror films this was William Friedkin and Brian De Palma two of the most influential directors in film history doing horror films and like you look at horror films today and if there is an auteur like director like um, Robert Eggers who directed The Witch and the Lighthouse or say Ari Aster who directed Hereditary and Midsommar they are directors that so far only work within horror and it seems like the really like the really s critically acclaimed uh, more like I'm gonna say highbrow but I don't mean highbrow in terms of like actually above but like people who aren't into horror will say that it's a thriller so that they can admit to liking it um, those sort of films are now not being directed by a Christopher Nolan but by a uh, an auto director who only seems to work within that genre which i think yeah. is quite interesting yeah like, like uh, today today if i mean there aren't many directors now who are what sell you on a film to be honest i think christopher nolan is one of the only ones where people go to see a film because christopher nolan directed it mm -hmm. um but like if christopher nolan said i'm directing a horror film i think people would be surprised but um, no one's really surprised that Stanley Kubrick directed a horror film because it was just back then there was more experimentation. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, do you, do you, or you, that um... you know Neil Gaiman, Sorry. don't you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Neil, Ga Neil Gaiman did a right um, did an interview with a Japanese British um, writer called Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, and Kazuo Ishiguro was promoting his new book, The Buried Giant, and it's a fantasy. And he had never written, to, at least to my knowledge, I'm not a big, big, like, expert on his work, but, like, he had never written a fantasy book before. And everyone's like, Kazuo Ishiguro's writing a fantasy book. And in this interview that Neil Gaiman did with him, Neil Gaiman, who has always worked within fantasy, says, what I find quite interesting about this Kazuo is that in the 70s you would have just been considered a writer mm, yeah yeah that's true you weren't really as beholden to one thing or the other yeah um so yeah like uh any closing thoughts for the limey and the yanks season two episode one on film <laughs> uh closing thoughts I hope that this um, continues and it should continue and the energy level on my part should increase <laughs> as it goes on. Um, so, uh, well, on that, on that uh, self-deprecating note, um, <laughs> thank you for listening and golfers are athletes. I completely disagree. You should talk about that again. I have more thoughts on that. <laughs>